Okay, thank, thanks, Alicia. I'll be very brief. Uh, it's very, I'm, I'm very happy to introduce Crystal Knoll, uh, who has been a postdoc in my group for a couple of years now. Um, many of you know her. Um, actually, I, uh, uh, I wanted her to come as a graduate student a long time ago after she <laughs> left MIT. She went to the West Coast instead to work with Hartmut Hefner at, at UC Berkeley. He did some uh, marvelous work on uh, using surface chip traps uh, uh, over there and studying some of the noise properties and getting up to speed with trap dimes, which is great. We got her, we got her uh, to JQI in any case, and uh, she has been uh, working on our, what we call our system experiment uh, with, with some of the other uh, leaders in the group. Uh, it's uh, arguably one of the most powerful quantum computers uh, in an academic setting for sure. And, and Crystal has spent uh, an awful lot of time connecting with um, uh, collaborators uh, across the country and across the world on, uh, on developing applications for her system. And so she'll talk about one such uh, 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 physics research topic involving uh, uh, measurement phase transitions. And this, of course, is a big part of our uh, 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 Physics for Tier Center and, and the, uh, the proposal on the QLCI. So uh, Crystal, I'll say before giving up to her, she, uh, she will be coming down to Duke University in a faculty position in ECE and physics uh, starting in 2022. So Crystal, the floor is yours. Thanks, Chris. All right. Um, so today I'll be talking about, uh, as Chris said, these, this kind of measurement induced transition um, that we call a dynamical purification phase transition. So I'll um, break that down for you a little bit uh, through my talk. So first, I just want to thank the team that I work with. We um, have a big experimental team here at uh, University of Maryland, um, led by our research scientists, Marco Tina, our PI, Chris Monroe, and several uh, graduate students. Um, I also collaborate closely with two theory collaborators, collaborators Pradeep and Michael, at University of Maryland. Um, just want to acknowledge our funding agencies uh, and as Chris said, this uh, operation will be moving down to Duke this summer, so we're excited about that. So the uh, idea that I'll be talking about today is what we call a monitored random circuit. And it's essentially an open quantum system where the measurement serves as this uh, interaction with the environment. And we have random unitaries occurring uh, as time goes on that provides some kind of entangling dynamics. And this, this model um, connects to ideas in condensed matter about per percolation, uh, as well as quantum error correction, uh, where you, know, you have your system with some entanglement in it, but you, you measure in order to correct for errors. So it's a very similar kind of dynamics. Uh, and in this model, at each time step, we measure the qubits with some probability p. So you can also think of this as like a measurement rate. So if it, um, we, can, we can tune this measurement rate to, from having no measurements in the dynamics all the way to measuring at every single step. Um, so that's kind of the model that we're looking at. And the phase transition happens as we tune this measurement probability, where below the critical point, we have a coding phase where long range entanglement survives. So this is where you have something like your um, error correcting code where your logical qubit survives um, despite still having some measurements mixed in there. So that's kind of the example I like to think of. And then on the other side of this critical point, uh, we have what you can call a failure phase where only short range entanglement survives and the measurements uh, kind of break up the system in that sense. So what we'd like to do is observe the properties of this transition. And we're gonna do that using our quantum computer that is uh, right there at the University of Maryland. And this is a picture of it here. It's inside this black box, um, which not only looks spiffy, but provides some measure of protection from the environment, any air currents in the room, temperature fluctuation, those kind of things. So inside that black box, the qubits that we use are ytterbium-171 ions. The two levels are in these hyperfine states shown here, 
uh, with a splitting of about 12.6 gigahertz. And we can measure the T2 uh, on, on a chain of ions um, for our spin qubit. And it's even in our large system over four seconds. And if one works very hard, you can achieve even over an hour. So our qubits are very, very long lived. We trapped the ions using a uh, microfabricated chat made by Sandia National Laboratories. And it's uh, shown in this, these pictures here. So it has many, many small electrodes uh, uh, fabricated in, which provides a very precise control of the potentials above the surface that we use to trap the chain and shape it. Uh, and our qubit detection is done using this uh, transition at 369 nanometers so that if the qubit is in this upspin state, it fluoresces and we can collect those photons. Whereas it's in, if it's in down, then we see no photons. So we can use a simple thresholding technique to read out the state of our qubit. And with a chain, um, we're able to do this using a multi-core fiber uh, such that each qubit gets its own core of this fiber, um, sort of its own readout path. And with this, we achieve um, good qubit uh, detection fidelity. The manipulation of the qubit state is done using a two photon Raman process that we address using a 355 nanometer pulse laser. And uh, using that, we can create uh, superpositions of zero and one as, as needed as for your qubit. Uh, and the way we address these Raman process, we can do it for each qubit individually. So each ion gets its own laser beam um, that's controlled by this 32 channel acoustic optic modulator made by Alfred Harris Corporation. And so that's one beam. And then we have a global beam that addresses the entire chain as our second Raman beam. So this provides us individual control of each qubit. Our two qubit gates are a molmer sorensen interaction. And uh, we do this by applying laser beams on any two qubits in the chain and tune them near the motional mode. So we have all these different um, modes of motion of the chain. Uh, and by tuning near them, we actually excite the motion and create a spin dependent force. Uh, and by shaping the, this pulse that we apply, the amplitude of the pulse, we can ensure that at the end of the gate, the motion in phase space has closed. Or in other words, this, the information is left entirely in the spin. The motion is out of the equation and we're left with this XX icing gate. Crystal, could I ask a question? Yes. Uh, this is Bill. Hi, Bill. Um, so here in this picture, you're showing the usual thing that we, that we understand that, that um, you can make uh, these entangling gates between distant ions. In your first uh, picture, you showed um, entangling that it at least invited us to think about entangling between adjacent uh, ions. And you said that, well, you got this phase transition, which we're going to hear about, um, in which... Um, uh, if you measure too much, you're going to destroy all but um, uh, nearby entanglement. So what I'm wondering is, mm -hmm. is it really nearby or uh, what's the deal? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a, that's a, a good question. And it, it actually is um, uh, a somewhat deep question for what we're studying. So we actually do need to think of the model specifically as being fully connected between all the qubits. So this is, um, this is different from only having adjacent uh, interactions. Um, but the, this idea of the, the phase transition still holds. And we're, we're able to so, show that with our simulations that I'll, I'll show a little bit later. But it, it is distinct uh, in that sense, yeah. But I guess I'm wondering is this idea of survival of, of uh, only nearby entanglement seems like that would be the case if you were only entangling things that were nearby. <laughs> you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, no, I guess I think of it more of a, of a, a fully connected graph and you're, you're still kind of cutting links. So you're, you're still creating um, kind of separations 
even if the system starts off as as okay okay i think i got it you you survive the entanglement but only the kind of entanglement that's created by a single entangling gate yeah, we're, we're still doing pairwise interactions. Yeah, right. But, but of course, if you let that go on for a while, you get a lot of entanglement. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and if you don't measure too often, then that would, uh, would survive as well. Anyway, you better get on with your talk because okay. otherwise... <laughs> we can always chat more at the, the discussion after. So. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so now we have our qubits, we have our gates. Uh, and we're ready to look at this as, as really a system. Um, so when we think about our quantum computer, uh, we look a lot at um, how can we incorporate automatic control? So in this example, we're actually um, loading a chain and we're loading in one ion at a time by starting in this loading zone, shuttling it over to the middle and merging it into the chain. So with the push of a button, we can load however many ions we need. Um, we use Python-based control, which makes it easy for us to code up new experiments and that kind of thing. Uh, and we also work closely with industry partners. Um, like I mentioned, L3 Harris built that AOM. And so this really allows us to approach it from a systems um, point of view. So we can look at kind of the metrics of our system performance. So I'll just give you a picture of what that looks like right now. Our, typically, we work with 13 qubits. We have all to all connectivity. Our two qubit gate fidelities are right around uh, 99%. And our single qubit gate fidelities are over uh, 99.9% fidelity. Uh, and then we have some small spam errors as well. Uh, so this is gonna be our tool that we're gonna use to study these um, transitions. So we return to this model of the monitored random circuit. And what I'd like to do now is adapt it to this ion trap system that we have. So now instead of random unitaries, we have random XX gates on randomly chosen pairs within the system. Um, and uh, as Bill pointed out, even though the system suggests they be adjacent qubits, um, these could actually be on any pair of your choosing. Uh, the next thing that we'll do is add a reference to a reference system. So we entangle this qubit in this, in our case, we use a single qubit um, at the beginning of the evolution with the system. And then instead of having to measure the entropy of the entire system as our order parameter, which is an expensive measurement, um, we can just measure the entropy of a single qubit. Uh, And then lastly, in our current experimental system, we measure all of the ions at the end of the circuit. So in order to have these um, measurements interspersed in the dynamics, we use ancilla qubits um, to defer the measurement until the end. So we now have our system, our reference, and our ancilla as kind of our chain of ions here. And then we have our dynamics and measure at the end. Uh, There's one more uh, sort of trick that we can play. So since our unitaries are XX gates, uh, we can tune the measurement probability at each step, as I described. But we can also tune the probability that those measurements are in the X basis. So we have this um, new parameter PX, which at each measurement is the probability that that measurement projects you into the X basis, which of course um, changes the dynamics that come after since we have all XX gates. Um, So now we have kind of these two axes of the phase diagram and whether we tune the measurement rate or the probability we're in X, we see these two phases. So again, we have our mixed coding phase where entanglement survives and a failure phase where it does not. And for the experiment, what we can do is fix our p-value to a low value, which constrains the number of measurements required and therefore the number of ancilla that we need uh, and instead tune p-x, this probability of measuring in the x basis. Uh, So this is what the quantum circuit looks like that we use for a system size of L equals six. 
So we have our six system qubits here, a single reference, and the three ancilla. And then time is moving to the right. So at the beginning, we entangle the reference with a system qubit to create a bell pair. Then we do uh, some scrambling within the system. And then we start our evolution. So you can see here where I've uh, denoted that we can do um, these XX gates or the unitaries between any pair that we'd like. And then with some probability after that, one of those qubits is measured. And I'll come back to this um, UF over here later on. Um, so yeah, so this is what a single circuit instance would look like. And so we can look at this experimentally as, as we evolve in time. So on the y-axis, we have the quantum entropy of the reference qubit. Um, so we measure this by measuring the reference in all three bases. And the simulation is shown in black and the experiment in blue. And on the left, we have an example of a circuit instance that stays mixed. Uh, and we see that the entropy stays high. Um, and as time goes on, we do see some noise um, creeping into the system. And then similarly on the right, we have a circuit that actually purifies at a certain time step. And you can see the experiment um, steps down at the same time as the expected simulation, um, but to some kind of plateaued value. But we have a clear separation between the mixed and the pure case. So this is nice. We can see the, the evolution of a single circuit. Um, and these, each of these data points uh, takes running three different circuits where we measure in each of these three bases. Uh, and so what we'd like to do is, is take it one step further to reduce the number of circuits that we need to run to study this transition. And so we do that using this, this feedback mechanism that I, I kind of glossed over before. The idea is basically instead of um, having the reference be in a random basis, we simulate the circuit um, ahead of time. We see that it purifies into a certain basis and then use this feedback to actually uh, rotate it into the Z basis. So that in the end, all we're really measuring is a classical entropy because uh, we know the reference is always in the Z basis. So it's just, is it zero or one? Uh, so these are uh, simulations here that show um, a little bit more of this evolution over time. So this, this is just showing the, the quantum entropy, but equivalently, we can look at the classical. And in the experiments, we fix the probe time and then average over many, many instances of these random circuits. And what we should see is that when we're in the pure phase uh, at this time, we see some kind of fixed small entropy because it's already uh, decayed quickly in time. Whereas in the mixed phase, we would see uh, a larger entropy close to one. And you would expect as the system size grows, um, these curves uh, also change. So you would see this in the pure phase, this would start to fall off faster. And in the mixed phase, we would um, plateau to this higher value as we get close to the thermodynamic limit. Um, and so that's what we want to begin to probe. So in our experiment, uh, we're able to look at three different system sizes of four, six, and eight. And we can see that in the coding phase, the entropy of this, this reference qubit, which represents the entropy of the system, increases as we increase the system size. And we see the opposite in the failure phase, and we see something um, sort of plateauing near the critical point where there would be an inflection between these, these two behaviors. Um, so if, if we're able to continue to increase the system size towards the thermodynamic limit, we would expect this, this trend to continue. And we see very good agreement between the experiment and the simulation. Uh, and in this case, these, these points here are simulations of the exact circuit that we ran. Uh, and these are uh, representative samples from simulated ensembles that extend to these larger system sizes. So now we've, we've kind of observed the behavior in, in the two phases, um, but we'd like to be able to probe the critical behavior closer um, to that critical point. 
And in order to do that, um, we'd like to have longer time evolution, uh, potentially also um, mid-circuit measurement so that um, we're not having to use all of these ancilla qubits. And then also we, of course, like to look at larger system sizes and start to um, approach closer to this, this limit. In order to do that in our experiment, uh, we need to do several different things for, we need to have deeper circuits. And over time in our system, we have a heating of the ion motion. So the deeper the circuit, the more heating that occurs. In order to do mid-circuit measurement, we need to be able to split the chain. Uh, so we can split the chain in two, measure uh, some of the ions without disturbing the others. And um, this shuttling process also heats. And then we'd also like to add more qubits, but as the chain gets longer, they also heat faster. So just lots of heating going on. So what we'd like to do is add a sympathetic coolant. And uh, what we're going to use is ytterbium-172, which is a different isotope of ytterbium. And we use a 435 nanometer laser to uh, address a narrow line with transition so that we have um, you know, little crosstalk, little to no crosstalk between the, the two isotopes. So we can kind of do our quantum operations on our 171 qubits and cool the 172 using uh, these lasers over here um, without disturbing our circuit. And we have some initial results from this cooling. So uh, I apologize, this plot's a little busy, but um, I'll break it down. So in gray in the background, this is a Rabi flop for a pure chain of 171 ions like we would normally use. Uh, and we can see that we have uh, pretty good contrast as time goes on. However, if we prepare the system and then wait for some time and then try and do the Rabi flop, we get this black curve. So we have a much faster decay and contrast. However, if we add in this cooling with the um, 435 laser, after that wait time, we recover the contrast in blue. And um, so we can already see that this, this cooling is starting to work in a long chain. And on the right, um, I'm showing that, that kind of the time that, that this will take. So the theta is the decay parameter of these curves over here. And um, basically we see that within about a millisecond, we can get some nice cooling. Um, so that's, that's great. Uh, so what, what can we do once we have these deeper circuits? Well, we'd like to probe some of the critical properties. Um, so I didn't talk much about it before, but this, this middle curve is in kind of this near critical regime. So um, close to the point where this curve goes from this decay uh, quickly into this mixed phase. Um, so we can characterize the decay of this exponential and this exponential decay parameter can be plotted against our um, PX that we're tuning. And we see this, this crossing happening here for different system sizes. And this is that, that critical point that we're after. So by, by probing how these, these different system sizes decay over time, we'll be able to see this, uh, these critical properties and, um, and, and look at some of its behavior more closely. Uh, okay, so with that, I'd just like to say one more thank you to the experimental team. We have a big team uh, here at University of Maryland working on this, um, and also some folks at Duke already. Um, and thanks to our advisor, Chris, and for all of you for your time today. Thank you. Yeah, that was a wonderful talk. And so now we have a few minutes for questions. So the floor is open. Uh, Crystal, I didn't quite understand the point about having to split the chain in order to make um, measurements as you, as you go along. Could you say a little bit more about that? Yes, yeah, I, I did that very quickly. Um, so, so the idea is in order to measure the qubits, we need to shine the, the laser on them and it has some width to it uh, that, that spans 
a few qubits. So if we were to try and measure just one of them in the chain, um, this beam would hit several. Uh, so so if, we, if we'd like to be able to measure one, we need to kind of move the other ions out of the way of the beam and, and direct the, the measurement at the single ion. Moving them away also prevents any scatter from that ion that's fluorescing from hitting the other ions and destroying their, their quantum state. Right, so, so that original picture that you showed us of an individual laser beam for each ion isn't quite right. <laughs> well, it's right for the um, coherent interactions. So we have those for, for the 355, for the qubit laser, but not for the, the readout. And ah. even, if we did, even if we did, if they were that close, the scatter um, right. from neighboring ions would, would still be a problem. Okay, so gotcha. This, this kind of gets us both of those things by shuttling them away. All right, gotcha. So maybe this is a very speculative question, but like, uh, do you have any feeling for how much bigger or, you know, how much longer or how many more qubits you can do? with the addition of the sympathetic cooling. I mean, I understand it's a huge experimental <laughs> effort to implement the whole thing, but you know, just gut feeling or vague back of the envelope intuition kind of. Sure, yeah. So um, in terms of, of chain length, um, I, I would anticipate we would still, we would not be near a hundred, you know, closer to 50 than a hundred. Um, just, just because the, the, it, it really does get, get very long, <laughs> um, and more other issues come up. So, so certainly closer to the 50 mark. Um, and then in terms of the, the cooling, you know, we, we have yet to experiment with, um, sort of interspersing the cooling within the circuits. Um, but there's, there's, so it's hard to say sort of how many times we'll be able to do that. Um, and we will have, you know, heating of other modes eventually that we're, we're not quite addressing with that cooling. Um, but, but these things are much later. And then eventually we'll hit our T2 times like way down the road. Um, but, but certainly, you know, moving more from our current range of 30, 50 gates to over a hundred. So this, this is, we're looking at like factors of two across the board, I guess is what I'm coming to and potentially okay. even more depending, depending how it works out. Well, fingers crossed that the interleaving works well. And then you guys yeah, we have, yeah, we have no reason to believe it won't. So, yeah. Yeah. I have a quick question. Um, do you have control over where the, um, the different isotopes of ytterbium are in the chain or is it just probabilistic? That's a great question. So at the beginning, we can deterministically load the chain how we'd like in the order of, of the different isotopes. Um, but we do have collisions with background gas that disrupt the, the order of the chain. So we essentially get a kind of a melting event and then they reorder when they recrystallize back into some, some random order. Um, so we will have to have kind of a protocol to deal with this. So we're, we're working on being able to deterministically reorder them in situ. And this is something that, that would be um, a, not a coherent process. So we would essentially detect something like this ha had happened in the middle of the circuit and then stop the coherent operations reorder and then go back and, and start over. Crystal, you might mention the rate at which the reordering happens. Oh, yes. So we see collisions that do this every few minutes or so. So okay. definitely something that, that will still have a very high duty cycle with, with actually running the circuits. Because we can, we can do the reordering in, in potentially like millisecond timeframes. So. Uh, I've got a question. Um, how close are you to being able to uh, actually do an error correction so that uh, the sequence you're doing, you could just say, you could imagine stacking it on infinitum and continuing the calculations? 
Um, so in, in, you mean having like a, 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 a real error correcting code kind of embedded in our system, like the yeah. entire? Yeah. Um, so, so that's something that, that for IONS is, is kind of further uh, down the road. Um, we do have such long T2 times already and our, our limiting factor is our two qubit gates. Um, so in terms of achieving that, our, our fidelities are, are currently not high enough to, to reach that, that kind of a forever qubit. Um, but there, there are ways we can, can use some of the ideas from error correction sort of in the shorter term without going full code um, that would still extend our, our operations. An, an, an intermediate error correction. Uh, right. Wow, okay. Okay. All right. Well, I think in the interest of time, we probably need to move on to our next speaker, but Crystal will be around after uh, the next talk for more discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, I will hand it over to Alexei to introduce our second speaker of the day. So while Simon is setting up, uh, maybe I can do the uh, introduction. So, um, so the next talk will be given by Simon Liu. So uh, after undergrad at Harvard, Simon went to get a PhD at Imperial College uh, London with Derek Lee. Um, so despite the very short UK PhD, uh, uh, Simon uh, still accomplished a lot, including some impressive uh, uh, seminal single author papers on topological phenomena in open systems. And then we were lucky to attract him to uh, come to JQI on a NIST NRC fellowship, where he's again doing uh, fantastic work, some of which he will tell us about today. So please, Simon. Awesome. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the uh, introduction, Alexi. Uh, and um, yeah, it's a real honor to be uh, to be speaking here today. Um, so uh, today I'll be talking about uh, dissipative phase transitions and autonomous error correction. And so this will be based on um, two papers that were just published last year. Okay, so everyone can see my slides. Okay. So, um, all right, so let me start by uh, saying a few words on uh, quantum phase transitions. And uh, even before that, let me just remind you about uh, thermal phase transitions, which we learned about in undergrad, uh, to be a, a competition between entropy and energy. So, roughly speaking, in a high temperature phase, you have all these particles and they're moving about, and it's very likely that they're in a state which has high entropy. But uh, at low temperature, something different happens. It's very likely that you find your uh, particles in a state which wants to minimize the energy. So you get this uh, disordered to ordered phase transition as you, as you vary the temperature, for example, in this uh, liquid to solid transition. But this paradigm is very general. Now, um, what we know nowadays is that uh, something uh, more subtle can happen exactly at zero temperature. Namely, you can have uh, quantum phase transitions. And these, uh, and these again arise due to some competition, uh, but now it's a competition between non-commuting terms in your Hamiltonian. So if you have two terms in your Hamiltonian, as you vary the relative strength of one uh, versus the other, um, then uh, the nature of your ground state can change because it wants to minimize one term, uh, the energy of one term with respect to the other. And as a function of this ratio, uh, you can get a phase transition. So um, uh, perhaps the most uh, famous paradigm is uh, what's called spontaneous symmetry breaking. And the most famous example is the transverse field Ising model. So let me uh, briefly uh, review some facts. So here uh, we have a 1D chain of spin half particles and there's a transverse field in Z and nearest neighbor coupling in X. And the model has a Z2 symmetry with respect to this SZ operator. Now there are two phases, one where the transverse field is dominant and basically all spins are pointing down in Z and another regime where uh, the coupling is dominant and you get these symmetry broken uh, ground states, either plus X or minus X. And if you look at the uh, picture of the spectrum, you get this following cartoon picture. There's a regime where um, the uh, ground state is twofold degenerate, another where it's uh, unique. And uh, between these two uh, limits, there's a, at the critical point, the, the energy gap closes. And this is because it's a second order phase transition. Okay, um, so this is a familiar paradigm, but uh, even more recently, what we know is that uh, uh, symmetry breaking is not the only mechanism for quantum phase transitions. 
Rather, there are also these uh, so-called topological transitions. And let me not uh, define this in any uh, precise way, but rather let me just give you an example. So uh, let's take uh, our icing model and then do a jordan Wigner transformation to Majorana fermions. And we arrive at this, um, this uh, hopping Hamiltonian on a 1D chain. Um, and so there is a, a, a near, so this uh, bipartite lattice with intracell hopping G and intercell hopping J. And uh, as you vary the relative ratio of these hopping strengths, you again get a transition from a, a state, a ground state, which is a, just a vacuum of quasi particles, to one where you get a twofold degenerate ground state. But now the mechanism is very much not symmetry breaking, but rather the presence of this uh, non local edge excitation. So in this topological regime, you get uh, unpaired Majorana modes at the boundary. And from these, you can create a single non-local excitation, which has support on both uh, the left and right uh, edge of your system. Okay, so um, so the point is that uh, both of these are, are phase transitions, but the mechanisms are quite different. But nevertheless, we can make uh, the following kind of unifying uh, statement, namely phases are characterized by their ground state degeneracy in the thermodynamic limit. And this cannot be lifted unless the energy gap closes or symmetry is broken. And for these topological transitions, the symmetry requirement is not always there. So for example, here we need fermion parity symmetry, which is uh, fundamental. Okay, so um, so what I'll be talking about today is uh, how this these, these very general paradigms can uh, uh, be generalized to open quantum systems. So um, let me now spend a slide uh, to motivate open quantum systems. And let me do this in a very uh, grandiose way. So one of the... Um, central challenges of the day is uh, how to design controllable quantum systems that do not decohere. So this is, um, you know, in other words, how do you build a quantum computer? So we want to be able to apply gates and make measurements, but at the same time, we don't want our quantum information to evaporate. And, um, and so uh, this forces us to think of the following abstract setting. We have some uh, quantum system of interest. It interacts with some larger environment. And we want uh, to find a way to precisely control this, uh, this quantum system. And so um, you know, without information leaking out. So uh, this is the, the starting point of this field of open quantum systems. And, um, and in general, this is a, a very difficult problem, but uh, fortunately for us, we can oftentimes get away uh, with a simplified uh, master equation description for our system. So uh, if, if your environment is Markovian and satisfies a few other properties, um, then uh, the evolution of, your, of, of the system's density matrix will follow this linear equation here. So let me just uh, go through it. So this, this part should look familiar. Uh, your density matrix evolves according to some coherent Hamiltonian, uh, but there's also this dissipation uh, encoded in these uh, so-called dissipators L. Um, which encode the uh, system environment coupling. So these arise due to a system environment coupling, although they act on the Hilbert space of the system alone. Okay, so it's nice because uh, it's a linear equation and, uh, um, and you only have to keep track of the Hilbert space of your system. So this will be our starting point today. And let me, um, let me now just uh, mention some facts. So these open systems now no longer have any notion of a ground state, but there is a steady state. So if you initialize your, your system in some arbitrary row I, evolve with the Lenblodian for a long time, you'll arrive at this steady state row SS. And this has the following property, uh, the Lenblodian kills the steady state and therefore um, it's a constant of the dynamics. And similarly, uh, now there's no really any notion of an energy gap, but we have this uh, dissipative gap. So namely uh, the smallest non-zero eigenvalue of L, I should say the real part. Uh, and this is, uh, sets the characteristic time scale at which a, an arbitrary row I evolves towards uh, the steady state. So now with these uh, definitions in place, let me be more concrete in what we're after. Um, so we'd like to identify dissipative phase transitions, uh, which are characterized by a steady state degeneracy, uh, which cannot be lifted unless the dissipative gap closes or asymmetry is broken. Okay, so we're, we're going to be working by analogy, and we're going to ask, uh, you know, whether the steady state, it, where you, whether you can have multiple steady states in a non-trivial phase, and um, in what sense is this uh, degeneracy robust? Okay, so this is, uh, again, like the big picture thing we're after, but uh, let me now motivate that this uh, steady state degeneracy is actually um, of practical relevance. Simon? Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, could you say what you mean when you say a dissipative gap? Or is uh, this just a gap that happens in a dissipative system? <laughs> is there something more to it? 
so, so the dissipative gap, uh, as I defined uh, here, is just the smallest non-zero eigenvalue of the Lindbladian. So, um, so, so you're, the Lindbladian is guaranteed to have at least one eigenvalue of zero. And now you could ask, uh, you know, what happens on top of it? It's it's very much analogous to um, to um, this notion of an energy gap in a in a, a closed system. So here you have a degenerate ground state or a unique ground state, but then there's a gap to the the rest to the rest of the modes. And similarly, in these open systems, you'll have you know a, a steady state or a degenerate steady state, and then a gap to the to the rest of the modes. Okay. Thanks. Right. Okay. So, um, all right, so let me now um, motivate uh, why uh, the steady state degeneracy is, um, uh, is of practical uh, relevance. Um, and let me uh, yet again shift, uh, shift gears and uh, talk about this idea of autonomous error correction. So um, let's imagine uh, the following abstract setting. We have uh, N, uh, a, a, a Hilbert space with N abstract levels. And uh, let's imagine that uh, I call uh, the subspace spanned by zero and one our qubit space, and let's uh, initialize our, our state in some arbitrary superposition of zero with one. Uh, then let's imagine that an error occurs. So uh, a bad Lindbladian L prime acts on our row I and takes you to a state uh, row prime. And uh, the million dollar uh, question is uh, how do you diagnose and fix these errors? So this is the field of quantum error correction, and there are many schemes, but the one I'll be talking about today is called autonomous error correction. And the way this works is that uh, we suppose that there exists a model with a qubit steady state structure. In other words, let's suppose there's a good Lindbladian L0 with the following property, namely it annihilates any uh, initial state row i that I choose. So for any choice of a and b, uh, this row i is a steady state of my good Lindbladian L0. And let's suppose that these are the only steady states. Uh, then it turns out that certain errors can be fixed in the following uh, very simple way. We just take uh, the bad state row prime, we evolve with the good Lindbladian L0, and uh, magically we arrive back at uh, the initial state. And so uh, the cartoon picture you should have in mind looks like this. After the error, you're in some bad state row prime with, with uh, bad fidelity, but after evolving with the good Lindbladian for a while, uh, you can uh, actually uh, recover the initial state that you started in. Okay, so this, uh, this paradigm is, is very cool because you don't need to do measurements or um, uh, feedback, uh, but unfortunately it also has its caveats. And uh, in particular, I'd like to raise um, the following two questions. So one is, uh, you know, how do we generically find such qubit steady state structures? So, um, so it's not at all obvious that nature should give us uh, these good Lindbladians L0, so how do, we, how do we hunt for these? And secondly, even if we find this, uh, what errors are correctable in this nice in, in this fashion? So it's not at all obvious that uh, all errors can be fixed in this way, and, and not all of them can. So how do we classify which ones um, are, are are passively correctable? So our work today will be addressing these questions, and let me uh, skip to the punchline. Uh, so we'll say that a strong symmetry broken phase is guaranteed this uh, qubit steady state structure, and moreover, uh, any error which keeps you within the phase is correctable in this in this passive way. Okay, so our, our, our novel work comes by connecting uh, this uh, error correction question to uh, driven dissipative phases. And uh, as a corollary to this, we can also ask, you know, what about topological transitions? Can we play the same game with uh, topological models? And uh, I'll, I'll, I won't give you a straight answer here, but uh, uh, rather I'll say what, uh, I'll highlight some difficulties with uh, generalizing topological transitions. Okay, so, um, that's, uh, that's it for my intro. Let me now uh, get to our, our uh, new work. So let me talk about uh, symmetry breaking in open systems. Um, and even um, before that, let me, let me just talk about uh, symmetries uh, in a Lindbladian. So it turns out that there is a subtlety in how one can impose a unitary symmetry on a Lindbladian. So uh, the first way is uh, what I'll be calling a strong symmetry. So let's suppose that uh, your Hamiltonian commutes with a symmetry operator P and the dissipators also all commute with uh, the symmetry operator P. Then at the level of the super operator, uh, the script L will commute with script P sub L and script P sub R, which are uh, defined in this way. So PL acts from the left and PR from the right. Um, but something more subtle can happen, namely, um, you could also have a weak symmetry. So here the Hamiltonian commutes with P, but now the dissipators only commute up to some non-zero phase. So um, uh, this is a weaker requirement on your dissipators. Uh, 
But nevertheless, at the level of the super operator, there's a notion of a symmetry. So script L will commute with script sub P, and script sub P is defined in this way. Okay, so these are just definitions, but um, it turns out that these are important definitions. And in particular, our work will address uh, for strong and weak symmetries, how does the steady state dimension and structure change across the symmetry breaking phase transition? So this will be kind of an orthogonal motivation for our work. Okay. Um, so let me now uh, actually get to the model that we study. So um, a concrete example is uh, this driven dissipative of photonic mode. So we have a cavity of photons and there's some uh, process which um, uh, drives uh, uh, photons into the cavity and there's also some leakage of photons into some larger environment. And uh, the rotating wave, uh, uh, the rotating frame uh, Hamiltonian uh, looks like this. So it's, uh, it's very simple. They're just um, photons uh, with some uh, frequency omega, the harmonic oscillator, uh, but also um, this uh, coherent uh, process which wants to inject and remove photons in pairs. So physically, this lambda is, uh, is the strength of the drive, uh, this two photon process, and uh, omega is the cavity drive detuning. And uh, we like this model because uh, it has a Z2 parity symmetry. So um, uh, H will commute with P, and P is just this uh, Bose parity operator. And that's because all terms here are even in bosons. Um, OK, and now, of course, we, we would like to make this uh, open problem. And so uh, we introduce these dissipators, which arise naturally. Uh, so L1 is single photon loss, L2 is two photon loss, and LD is dephasing. Um, and notice that uh, L1 anti-commutes with P, but L2 and LD uh, commute with P. So we'll say that um, uh, without single photon loss, kappa 1 equals 0, the model has a strong symmetry, and otherwise it has a weak symmetry. So as we tune this kappa 1 from, some, from 0 to non-zero, we'll tune between a model with uh, weak and strong symmetry. Okay, so this is all we need. This, is, this simple setup is all we need to find um, some interesting behavior. Um, so let me now show you the phase diagram for this model. So on the x-axis here, we have the, um, the drive strength uh, of our system. On the y-axis, we have the single photon loss uh, strength. And we notice that there are two parameter regimes, one where the, uh, where the order parameter is 0 and another where the order parameter is non-zero. But um, actually, there's, uh, there's more going on to this phase diagram than just this, depending on whether you have a weak or strong symmetry. So here, these integers indicate the dimension of your steady state manifold, that is, how many steady state solutions you have. And let me just briefly go through each of these quadrants. So in the upper left here, you have a unique steady state, which is basically just a vacuum of photons. In the upper right, you have a classical bit, namely a classical mixture of plus alpha with minus alpha is stable. Bottom left, you have a, another classical bit. So any uh, classical mixture of zero with one photon occupied is stable. And in the bottom right, you have something interesting. You have a qubit steady state structure. That means that any coherent superposition of plus alpha with minus alpha is stable. So uh, we've answered one of the questions in our intro. Where do we find good Lindbladians with qubit steady state structures? Well, a strong symmetry broken phase will guarantee this. And I should say this is guaranteed in the thermodynamic limit. And, uh, in our, and for this model, the thermodynamic limit is set by this parameter lambda over kappa two, which sets the number of, of photons in the, in the coherent state alpha. Okay, so, um, so we, we find this, uh, this nice uh, phase diagram. Um, uh, now we can ask uh, you know, a more uh, sophisticated question, namely, in what sense can we do error correction on this? So um, let's suppose that uh, we've encoded a qubit into the steady state. So we're in the strong symmetry broken phase and, and we've uh, initialized our system in some uh, superposition like this. Well, what terms are we protected against? And in particular, let's think of the following protocol. We um, start in a pure uh, qubit state row i. Uh, we then quench with an error uh, L prime to some bad state row m. And then we evolve with our uh, favorite Lindbladian L naught uh, back to some final state row f. And we'd like to ask uh, for what errors and for what quench times do the initial and final states um, match? Okay, so um, uh, so um, we've uh, so after the error has occurred, you're in some uh, bad state row m. Uh, but then after evolving with uh, the good Lindbladian, uh, you'll be um, back in some uh, 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 row final. And we'd like to know when when does row final match row initial? Um, so let me uh, let me show you. Um, uh, our results. So we get a perfect recovery of the fidelity in the thermodynamic limit. So uh, let's imagine that um, we have a, a detuning error. So our Hamiltonian will, uh, will have an error, which is uh, omega a dagger a. 
and uh, let's suppose that it uh, acts for a long time. Uh, so we get the following behavior. So um, here I'm plotting the fidelity between the uh, initial and the final state as a function of this thermodynamic parameter n. And uh, the black dots are uh, the case of a, a relatively small error, and the red dots are the case for a, a large error. And so what you see is this kind of threshold behavior. So for, for weak errors, um, the system is able to recover its fidelity in the thermodynamic limit as n goes to infinity. And uh, in the opposite case where these errors are um, very strong, then uh, the fidelity actually gets um, uh, worse as a function of, uh, of, of this thermodynamic parameter. These are actually quite similar to the plots we saw in the last talk. Um, um, and so uh, you could ask, you know, what is this phase boundary uh, between, um, you know, recoverable and non-recoverable? Um, and uh, what we find is that, um, uh, you know, this is directly related to the phase diagram that I showed you in the, in the previous slide. So you only get perfect uh, recovery uh, in the thermodynamic limit uh, for quenches within the, the strong symmetry broken phase. Okay. And uh, more generally, uh, this allows us to do a classification of errors. So um, we can ask, you know, what errors um, keep the model in the, in the strong broken phase? And, uh, uh, and so here, this, this chart summarizes our results. Um, the, the, the first column here uh, goes through different uh, possible uh, errors. And we just have to ask whether this error keeps the model in the strong symmetry broken phase or not. And, uh, and this directly answers whether um, our, um, our, uh, the error can be self-corrected or not. So um, single photon loss is not strongly symmetric. So unfortunately, this is not correctable in our scheme. Uh, but um, uh, the Hamiltonian error is uh, strongly symmetric. And depending on its magnitude, it can be correct, self-correcting or not. And dephasing errors um, uh, are also uh, follow the same paradigm. And so they can be self-correcting if they're weak enough. Um, OK, uh, so I, at this point, I should also uh, mention that um, you know, this, this paradigm of uh, uh, quantum computing using CAT codes is not just a theoretical fantasy, but it's really a, a very active uh, direction. And uh, unfortunately, you know, single photon loss is not something that you, sh you can just neglect, neglect an experiment. And this is what uh, sets the lifetime. Um, so, uh, so the annoying thing about uh, uh, um, a result is that we still require our errors to have strong symmetry, and that's kind of unreasonable for, for a realistic system. Okay, so um, with that, let me now kind of move on to the second uh, thing I wanted to talk about today, which is, um, you know, can we basically do the same thing with uh, uh, topological models and uh, models which have, uh, you know, either s uh, some kind of symmetry protected topological order, can we, can we repeat the same story? And the reason this might be more helpful is that certain topological models have, uh, are protected by uh, very robust symmetries and, and maybe, you know, uh, the stability uh, of, of these systems could be better than them. Um, than what you would get from a symmetry break. So let me show you uh, why this the, the story here is not so straightforward. Um, okay, so uh, let's uh, think back uh, again to our favorite Kataev chain, um, uh, but now let's introduce uh, some dissipation. So here, this is uh, the model I showed you in my intro, but now we also include a single uh, fermion loss. And um, uh, the model is nice because it has a, a, a it, all terms your, in your Limbladian are quadratic and fermion number, uh, fermion operators, and therefore it can be diagonalized in this um, quadratic way. These betas are uh, uh, fermionic uh, super operator quasi particles. And uh, you can find the many body spectrum just from these single particle complex eigenvalues lambda i. And, um, and if you look at these uh, lambda i, what you find is that, uh, you know, again, they're complex and they come with a real and imaginary part. Uh, and the real part uh, defines their energy or the frequency at which these modes propagate, and the imaginary part um, gives, if, um, gives you their decay rate. And so what you find is that there's something topological in this energy sector in the sense that there's a, a bulk band gap and uh, edge modes which are pinned exactly to zero in between them, uh, and these are uh, protected. Uh, but if you look at their decay rate, these edge modes are nothing special. So they, they come with their own lifetime, and therefore these edge modes do not uh, uh, um, result in degenerate steady states. So, so the good news is that there do exist these dissipative extensions of topological edge modes, and these lead to um, you know, experimental signatures such as a, a zero bias peak. Um, uh, 
But uh, the bad news is that uh, these edge modes do not have uh, uh, infinite lifetime. Uh, they have a non-zero decay rate, and therefore they don't they don't lead to these degenerate steady states, which were key to our uh, symmetry breaking analysis. And so the fundamental question that I think is still uh, very much open is: uh, Do these topologically degenerate are these topologically degenerate steady states fundamentally forbidden, or do we just have to go beyond quadratic Lombardians? So this is, uh, I think, um, uh, um, an open question. Uh, and very briefly, let me just um, go through the rest of, um, uh, let me just uh, highlight um, uh, the rest of our uh, uh, study. Um, so, um, so this single particle uh, spectrum, uh, these lambda i's are determined uh, by diagonalizing a spectral matrix Z, uh, which has two parts. It has a, a Hamiltonian part and a dissipative part. Um, and uh, for closed systems, we know that uh, topological band insulators are, are fully classified within this tenfold way um, um, formalism. So a natural question to ask is, uh, you know, do these quadratic Lindbladians admit a similar tenfold way formalism? So um, in our work, we address uh, exactly this question and we show that um, uh, the spectral matrix Z uh, indeed has to belong to one of 10 symmetry classes. And these are in one-to-one -one correspondence with, with the closed case. Um, and uh, the punchline of, of all this is that um, uh, edge modes are protected in their in their frequency, but generically acquire lifetime. So exactly uh, what I said in the previous slide. Uh, so the cartoon picture you should have in mind is like this: uh, in the closed limit, you have some uh, uh, band insulator with with edge modes uh, protected in between. Uh, as you start to add dissipation to the system, generically, what will happen is that these these edge modes uh, will still be pinned to lie within the the energy gap, but uh, will will start to acquire uh, a non-zero decay rate. Okay, um, so I think uh, uh, with that, let me uh, just uh, briefly summarize. And um, so, so uh, I told you that uh, a strong symmetry broken phase will host a cubic steady state stru uh, structure. And more generally, our work establishes this connection between driven dissipative phase transitions and error correction. And uh, a future outlook, uh, I think the most pressing question is still like, what is a, a driven dissipative symmetry protected topological phase looks like? Is this fundamentally forbidden or, uh, or not? Uh, and with that, let me, uh, let me thank you for your attention and acknowledge my awesome collaborators on, on both of these projects. So um, on the symmetry breaking side, uh, I worked with uh, Alexi's group here at UMD. And um, on the uh, topological side, I worked with uh, Nigel's group in Cambridge. And let me just point out that um, uh, we received some uh, nice uh, media coverage for both of these projects um, from NIST and uh, Nature Physics. And uh, yes, I'm happy to answer questions. Well, thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, so the floor is open for questions. Well, I'll have, uh, um, I wanna go back to the very beginning when you first um, talked about quantum phase transitions and compared them to thermodynamic phase transitions. Mm -hmm. Now, when I first learned about the concept of a quantum phase transition, what I was told was that um, uh, uh, in a thermodynamic phase transition, the phase transition is driven by uh, thermal fluctuations and in a quantum phase transition, it's driven by quantum fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Now, what you told us didn't sound like that, but I have a sneaking feeling it's probably at least related. So could you say something about that? Right. Um, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, um, so I, so for quantum, um, so I could, I, I guess, uh, um, it's kind of a vague question. Like, do you, could could you phrase it in a more concrete way, please? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. Uh, I, I don't know but, if I have uh, a lot of intuition but, for how to. Okay, um, let's let's uh, say I think about something like a melting transition. Mm -hmm. Then it's sort of obviously that the that the thermal uh, fluctuations are stronger than the uh, the uh, the things that are trying to bind things together. That's not too different than your. Uh, idea of entropy versus energy. Right, but right. now in a, in a quantum phase transition, I'm mm -hmm. thinking of something like the, um, uh, the Mott transition, the, the tunneling is stronger or weaker than the, um, 
uh, mm -hmm. repulsive interactions. And, there, and, and if you think of the tunneling as being quantum fluctuations, that is, it's a kind of a, uh, it's related to whether or not you're going to find a, uh, an object at one lattice location or an, another, that I think of that as being a quantum fluctuation that's related to the tunneling. Uh, but that didn't sound much like what you were telling us a quantum phase transition is. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, I'm not sure if I have a good answer for how to reconcile these pictures, but uh, I see what you mean. Yeah, so, so uh, um, thermal fluctuations on top of, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, like for example, in the icing one. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I think maybe there are sort of two, my picture is that there's sort of two separate questions. Mm -hmm. Like one is this question of what's the ground state or what is the, the equilibrium state? Mm -hmm. And that is given by this sort of entropy versus energy or these competing terms in the Hamiltonian. And mm -hmm. then there's sort of a separate question that if you, if you go across this phase transition or you sit near the critical point, then mm -hmm. what, what do the dynamics look like? And I guess my picture was always is that's where the, the fluctuations enter. And, and so that this sort of might be slightly separate axes or slightly separate sort of consequences. I don't know. That, that's the picture that I've always had. Yeah. Okay, so you're telling me that I'm asking about how you make the transition and Simon was telling me about what the transition is between. <laughs> I, I think so, because if you think it's strictly zero temperature, there should be, you know, you can ask a very well-defined question, what's the ground state here at zero temperature? What's the ground state there at zero temperature for a quantum phase transition? Well, actually, at, do fluctuations sorry. really enter at that point? Well, I think, I think the point is that, you know, in these extreme limits, uh, which I mentioned, uh, you know, your, your ground state is really everything pointing in plus X or minus X. But then as you start to turn on the transverse field, you know, these cause quantum fluctuations on top of these uh, cat state or these symmetry broken states. And uh, eventually, you know, your, your, your ground state becomes so disordered that uh, it, it'll, it'll go to a phase where the, the thermal field is, is, is dominant and basically everything is pointing upwards. And I think that's how to reconcile these pictures. Uh, but uh, yeah, I need to think of it around this. Yeah. Well, maybe I could follow up on that by asking for this audience, hmm. is Bose-Einstein condensation of an ideal gas a quantum phase trans? transition uh, under yeah. this definition because uh, we use i mean i usually think of it as well uh the transition happens when the uh de broglie wavelength becomes yeah. comparable to the uh, spacing between the average spacing between particles right and now does that can you link that to pictures of can you link fluctuations to that in an essential way so I, so I guess in, in, in my understanding is, uh, um, you know, you could get a superfluid to mott fluid transition. Uh, um, that, that's a, a quantum phase transition, which is characterized by the breaking of um, uh, the U1 phase of the, of the global wave function, right? So in a superfluid phase, you, you, uh, your system um, uh, spontaneously breaks the U1 uh, symmetry of its global wave function in the, in the mod insulator phase, it doesn't. So I think that's, that's how I would... Uh, so, so in that sense, it should fit this paradigm of, of, of what I've been discussing today. You get a symmetry breaking phase transition as a function of uh, different competing terms in your, um, in your Hamiltonian uh, and uh, the correlation length should, should diverge uh, at the, um, the critical point. Okay, but what's the answer? Are you saying that's a thermodynamic transition or a quantum? No, I'm saying it's a zero temperature um, uh, quantum phase transition. No, no, but, but, but Bose condensation happens at non-zero temperature. Oh, um, super yeah, that's why it's so interesting. Quantum. Yeah, it, and I, right. I've, I've thought of it, well, in, in my adulthood, I've thought of it as being a thermodynamic phase transition, even though it's completely driven by quantum phenomena. <laughs> hmm. So, right. Bill, you're saying that Bose-Einstein condensation would not be a quantum phase transition. That's what I'm saying, yes. Un under, the, under the definitions that are being discussed here. Right, which I think right. is correct. Under yeah, which, right. under both mine and Simon's, I think it's a thermodynamic phase transition. Mm -hmm. 
driven mm-hmm. by quantum symmetry. That's the thing that's so amazing about it. But <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I agree. Yeah.